Hello, you beautiful souls out there, and welcome back to the Sex, Drugs, and Jesus podcast. I hope you all are doing fan fucking tastic as myself and my guest, Jake Dedinsky, are doing. Jake, how are you? I'm good. I am just happy to have another day on this earth and, you know, living the dream one day at a time. Hallelujah, tabernacle and praise. And so, y'all, is he Lobo which stands for lights out, bark out, I believe. Lights out, barks out, I believe is what that stands for. He runs the Lobo podcast and as well, he is a DJ, an event promoter, and a music producer. And so he's living a high energy life. <laughs> and today on this show, we're going to be talking about his medical history. He has something that's called mitochondrial disease, which I had never heard from before. He's going to be telling us about his Lobo initiative, what his nonprofit does, and what it can do for you. So let's start with your own history. Like, what is it you would like to tell us about yourself? Yeah. So the first thing people will notice about me, I'm sure during this podcast, and just by listening to me, is I'm severely ADHD. So if I jump around a lot, I apologize. In addition to that, I'm also on the spectrum, very proudly, actually. So uh, those are two of like my badges of honor. ADHD, very much so neurodivergent. As you mentioned, I have the mitochondrial disease. That was diagnosed when I was, I think, four. Both me and my two brothers have it with no other trace of it in my family. I like to often joke that my mom had three boys and hit the lottery. All three boys with a condition that is only passed through the mother that she doesn't have. So go figure. <laughs> you know, that's always often the joke. I am a DJ. I'm a producer. I run Lights Out, Barks Out, the event all over the country, in addition to our Lobo Initiative nonprofit, as well as I am a soccer journalist. I have previously worked in politics. I've kind of been all over the place, you know, run an esports team. I, if it exists, I will do it. My whole thing is that basically, I don't know how much time I have on this earth because people of my condition don't typically live to be my age. And so I'm trying to take full advantage of it and live as much of a life to the fullest as I can. I admire you and I encourage your, your strength that you have there, that you keep going. So, so you're saying people with your disease don't usually live to your age. How old are you as of today? I am 29. I will turn 30 in, uh, in April, April 16th. Yes, I can do this. April 16th. I will turn 30. I will be officially gay dead as the kids say, but I am very excited to be in my thirties and looking forward to that chapter. You should be looking forward to it. Thirties are wonderful. That's when we really solidify who we are. So how long do people typically live with this disease if, if 29 is so far out? So it's one of those things where it's, it's really like with the mitochondrial disease, it's kind of hard to, to put a number on it, right? Because the way I explain it is mitochondria cells are in everything in the body, right? So when your mitochondria don't work, that means nothing in your body works the way it's supposed to. And when you have a deficiency where certain things in your body might work and other things may not, it's very hard to follow a path of how that condition may go. So there's really not one person who has my condition that has the exact same symptoms as anybody else. I often compare it to if you take a bag of a million jelly beans and try to pick out the same one twice, the odds of doing that are slim to none. So on the one hand, you have people like me who are less affected, but could go immediately plummeting like I was in the hospital three weeks ago out of the blue. Or you have people on the other end who are very, very, very severely affected who don't make it to V3 or 4. And there's a whole bunch of subconditions. And as we learn more and more about it, with genetic conditioning and genetic testing, like we are able to start to pinpoint it more. But essentially, it's one of those things where it's really kind of a crapshoot because you just don't know. You just, it, it's, I was hospitalized with a minor virus that spread that nearly took me out. And that was terrifying. And it's something that, you know, it's one of those things where you just kind of, you never really know with my condition. And that is something that weighs on you a lot as a person. Hmm. Okay. So tell us like, you know, scientifically, you, you've said that the, the mitochondria don't work or there's not enough of them. Tell us exactly like your definition of mitochondrial disease. Yeah. So with the mitochondrial disease, the scientific definition is essentially if you have a deficiency within your mitochondria cell, the mitochondria cell itself, 
then you have a mitochondrial disease. Within that, there is a much broader spectrum of which one you have. It can go, it is a very wide ranging spectrum. I think there's like 67, 68 different subconditions of mitochondrial disease. With myself, essentially the, the most common thing that almost everyone with a mito deficiency has is an energy deficiency, right? So right out the gate, mitochondria produce like 96, 97% of the body's energy. So if they're not working, right, you're already starting off with a low energy and having a low energy can lead to other things like having a weak immune system. And then you get into things like I said, every single organ, every single part of your body has mitochondria cells in it. So if your cell mitochondria cells aren't working the way they should be, you're going to have deficiencies in those or organs. So as an example, I had a feeding tube from the time I was like 13 to the time I was 22. My, when I was 13, 14 years old, I was like 56 pounds and four feet tall. I was diagnosed failure to thrive. They had tried everything and I was eating like a machine, but I was metabolizing things so quickly that the food wouldn't like do anything. It would just go right through, right? So I had a feeding tube. And because of that, that's a lot of where my ADHD and my autism comes from, the mitochondria. I issues, gastritis, gastroparesis, kidney stones since I was 13, all, all this fun stuff, all stems traditionally from the mitochondrial disease as a baseline. Well, like that's like a lot. That's like fucking a lot. Like, but yes, I, I looked up real quick and I saw that about one in 5,000 people, both in the United States and globally have this disease. Yeah. And a lot of times it goes undiagnosed because a lot of doctors don't know what it is. So like most doctors, when I say mitochondrial disease, think I'm talking about multiple sclerosis, which are two very, 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 very different conditions. I mean, they couldn't be further apart. One is very much so brain related and one is very much so body oriented. You know, also I've heard people say, oh, Mito, that must be muscular dystrophy. That's another one closer, but not exactly the same. I have been guilty myself of walking into the ER and being like, yeah, I just have muscular dystrophy because if I say mitochondrial disease, I've had doctors look at me like I'm making something up. And that has happened to me in the ER multiple times. I went in to actually... When I was admitted to the hospital, the first doctor I saw thought I was just there to get opioids because I was making up something that he'd never heard of. And that was a whole wonderful experience where I was like, dude, no, I'm here because I'm in pain and don't want to be on opioids. Please don't give me opioids. This is a real thing. You should know this. You're a medical professional. I like that a son of a bitch. <laughs> right? <laughs> like there's nothing more infuriating than walking in to like, a hospital and then being like yeah we don't think this is a legitimate thing this is like we've never heard of it can or like having you and i don't mind having you explain to a doctor my condition i usually just walk in with a binder now that i just like hand them i'm like here's everything you need to know about my condition from like medical specialists in my in my specialized in mito just read this and call them if you have any questions because at this point like i'm so tired of giving the spiel to these doctors that it's just it's frustrating and oftentimes they just don't want to hear it i had to tell the uh, when they were giving me my scope in the hospital to check my stomach, I'm like, you got to make sure you don't give me lactic ringers. I will have a reaction. And the nurse looked at me like I had three heads because most patients don't tell a nurse that they can't have lactic ringers or even know what lactic ringers are. So the fact that that was mentioned is just kind of one of the things that I've been doing for so long. It doesn't phase me anymore. <laughs> OK, and then I read where you have an had an IEP all the way through adulthood. Yeah. Into adulthood, and I'm assuming that stands for an individualized education plan. Yes. So one of the things that is actually very dear and important to my heart is special education. I intend to run for school board at some point in my life. I think that people with disabilities need more representation on school boards from those who have gone through the special education program. I had an IEP. Originally, they wanted to give me a 504 plan, I believe, which is the alternative. But my mother made sure it was an IEP because she was a lawyer and knew the system which is unfortunately something that a lot of kids don't have access to. But that is part of the reason I want to get involved. We'll come back around to that. But I was on an IEP. Originally, they wanted to hold me back in third grade because I couldn't write cursive. Uh, that was a whole thing. They gave me a bunch of tests. They came back and they said, we can't hold this kid back. He's reading at a college level. He's writing at a college level. We should actually skip him ahead of grade. And that was like a complete whirlwind. So, yeah, but the IEP was literally one of the things that helped me get through school. I actually had to go to three, to three different high schools before they finally figured out a system that worked for me. When I was at my first high school, 
I was getting like D's and F's, but they couldn't figure out why because I was getting perfect scores on the state test in Virginia. And I was getting like perfect scores on all my exams. And the reason was I wasn't doing the homework because it bored me. It wasn't challenging enough. And so I just was like, I'm not going to do it. Like it doesn't, I don't gain anything from this. So I would just like do the exams and then not bother with the homework because I knew most of the material. Then they moved me to a second school where I had a teacher tell me that I couldn't go on a field trip with my journalism class because she didn't want to be responsible for my medical condition because she didn't think I could ride the Metro for an hour with kidney stones, which was a whole thing. And my mom said, uh, -uh we're not doing this. Like we're going to, we're going to find a different place. Cause this is not like acceptable. And then finally I arrived at Falls Church High School in Virginia, which is where I ended up graduating from and will always have a special place in my heart, which is why I continue to go back there and visit and get back to the school. But there, they kind of realized that they had to create almost this alternative, like, plan to help me, I guess, or I guess make it more accessible for me, right? Because what ended up happening was I was doing all these classes and I was, I was getting, like I said, perfect scores. And I was eventually they came up with the quantity or quality versus quantity argument, which meant that if I could prove that I was getting the material, it wasn't how much work I was doing versus the qual the quality of the work I was doing. So at one point during my senior year, we ended up with the situation because I started in Maryland that I had to take world history one. And in Virginia, that is a freshman class in Maryland. That is a senior class. I, at that point did not want to spend an entire school year surrounded by freshmen. Not that I had any problem with it. It was just that for me, with being on the spectrum of a bunch of other issues, I was having a really hard time connecting with the freshmen being older. And also I had always had a hard time kind of in school connecting with people my own age. I often spent most of my lunch periods hanging out with the staff and teachers. So they allowed me to spend that period with my teacher from the previous year in U.S. history um, and, you know, helping him with grading papers and teaching U.S. history. And whenever world history had a test, I would take that test and I would pass it. And that was kind of how they allowed me to navigate my senior year. Most schools wouldn't have been okay with that. But in this situation, they realized that if they were going to fail me because of this, it would have it would have made no sense because at the end of the year, I got a perfect score on the state test, which is something that should be eliminated altogether because state testing is a joke and a massive fraud and realistically isn't the way we should be measuring people's success. But that's a whole other story. Mm -hmm. Wow, thank you for going into such great detail with that. I appreciate it because those are sort of, that's the sort of information that helps people. So in my research of you, I, you, know, you I, I came across where you felt like your mom protected you way too much because of this chronic illness. I got the sense that maybe other parents do the same sort of, maybe like overprotection thing. So I want to know like what advice you would give both to uh, young people who have this disease and also to the parents of young people who have this disease. Yeah. So I think first and foremost, I should acknowledge that while my mom and I don't have the world's best relationship, I acknowledge that she did the best that she could, right? She had three boys, all of a chronic illness that she had no experience with as a single mother. And I respect the hell out of the fact that she did the best that she could in the circumstances that she could. And we lived a relatively comfortable life growing up. And I will always have that respect for her, right? That That's never going to go anywhere, regardless of how strained our relationship is. That being said, I think that it's important, not just for parents of people with mito, but for parents, I'll start there, parents, especially of kids with chronic illnesses, to understand that, you know, at a certain point in time, you're not going to be there for your child anymore, right? Like at a certain point in time, your child's going to have to go out into the world in theory, and figure it out on their own. And if you protect them to a point where they get there and they're so used to people doing things for them that they don't know how to handle themselves, it can create massive roadblocks and relearning experiences that put them behind the eight ball. Like I had never filed taxes previously up until a couple of years ago because I had always been claimed as a dependent. And then all of a sudden I wasn't a dependent and I had no idea how to do it. And it was like incredibly overwhelming and incredibly alarming for me. And that was something that I legitimately had to teach myself because I just had, had never even occurred to me. I think that the, in, the instinct just for parents in general 
is to protect, right? Because this is this is someone, this is your child, right? Like you want the best for them and you're afraid sometimes to take your hands off the wheel. But I think that you have to trust and find the balance of letting your kid going go out and fail and learn from that experience, but also being there to pick them back up when they do. Because what I'm not saying to do is just push them out the nest and say, okay, figure it out. But I'm also not saying like to protect them to a point where they have no idea and think the world is this perfectly welcoming place to people with disabilities. Because the reality is the world is really hard for people with disabilities. It just is. It is not a nice world out there at times. And that's something that I think a lot of kids with chronic illnesses, when they become into adulthood, find out the hard way. As for children and those teens, especially young adults going through this, trying to find their independence and express that they can do things, you know, the way I finally got my mom to get it was just by demonstrating that I was capable of doing things. And eventually, if she really was adamantly against something and I really thought I could do it, I would just do it. And at the end of the day, it may have led to some strain, but ultimately, in the end, she understood afterwards that I was just trying to show that I could I could complete what I was trying to set my mind to. You know, she was pretty adamant against me becoming a DJ because she didn't think it would be good for me with my medical condition. And so because of that and because of my dad previously being a DJ and thinking it would be a really hard world to navigate for someone on the spectrum and all these other things. She did not want to get me DJ equipment when I was younger. So I went on and bought my own. And then three years later, she came to see me play. And she's like, wow, you're really good at this. Like, you should be doing this professionally. I'm like, I am. That's what I've been trying to tell you for the last three years is that I, I'm good at what I do. And I'm okay with the trade-off that it affects me medically because I make a bunch of people happy. And that's okay with me. But I think that not everybody has the ability to advocate like that, right? So I would just say if you are a, a teen or a young adult out there and you're saying, man, I really wish my mom or my dad would like just get get this point through their head, just sit them down and be like, look, at a certain point, there's going to come a time when you just can't protect me anymore and I need to know how to navigate the world. And I think having that quote unquote come to Jesus moment with them will really, really help open their eyes. So the, the strain that you spoke of between you and your mother was, is that the primary reason there was strain because, you know, you were getting away from her control and it sounds like she wanted what she thought was best and you had a different point of view and maybe she took that personally. Is that what, is, or was there something else that strained y'all even further? I think a lot of it came down to the fact that she ultimately wanted to, wanted what was best for me in her eyes and I wanted what was best for me in my eyes. And I was the oldest, right? I was her firstborn. So automatically, she's going to be the most protective because she hadn't done it before. And traditionally, parents who have multiple children, the firstborn is often told, like, no, 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 like, very protected. But then the second and third or however many kids come after are often allowed to do things that the firstborn may not have been allowed to. Like, I wanted to play a mystery in middle school. I was told no, but my brothers both joined band in middle school. And unfortunately, growing up, it's not as big of an issue now, but growing up, there was a lot of resentment there because, well, why are you allowing my brothers to do the things you told me I couldn't? But as I grow older, I kind of understand and try to piece together those decisions and it starts to make more sense to me. But in the moment, it created a lot of heat and strife. But a lot of it, I think, did come down to the fact that, yes, she wanted a lot of control, wanted to kind of, in her mind, this is what's best. You know, I know what's best. Like, I've done it. And a lot of it came down to me feeling like I was never quite good enough to live up to her expectations. And that kind of created a lot of headbutting where, you know, being on the spectrum, a lot of these ideas kind of sort of fill in my head. And whether they were true or not, that's what became the image of my mother in my mind. Now, we have come a long way since then. She is very supportive of my career now. She is very supportive of me now. She really does the best that she can. But as my fiance says, I think that she is at the point where she just wants to be my like best friend and sometimes not as much of like that supportive mother figure, if that makes sense. Which one would you prefer? The best I mean, or do you want both? I mean, every kid wants to have that relationship with their mother, right? Where it was like, you know, where it's mom, right? Like I can call mom and have her do cartwheels because I'm playing in New York City like I was last week and 
you know, the reaction I got was, yeah, that's kind of cool. Okay. As opposed to like this overwhelming beaming of pride. For me, that was a very big moment. And so I think there's always a part of me that will want that relationship. But to understand that you have to go back to the relationship I had with her mother, my grandmother, which was she was my best friend. She was absolutely, without a doubt, the person I was closest to on this earth. Um, I came out to her first when I was like 16. And she's like, yeah, OK, let me take you to the sex shop. Like, let me help you. Like, if you need a place to, you know, do extracurriculars with people that's not your house, that's mm -hmm. fine. You can do it here. Like, grandma was the shit. Like, grandma used to have gay parties at her house all the time when she was younger. Grandma used to have all the kids in her neighborhood when my mom and my uncle were younger come over and party in her basement so that if they wanted to do drugs or something, they could do it under the supervision of a of an adult. And if they something happened, she would drive them to the hospital. And all the parents in the neighborhood were fine with this because they'd rather them be doing it under the supervision of somebody than doing it out on the streets. And so these underground parties would just happen at my grandma's house back back in the day. And so she was literally everything I aspired to be. She would give you the shirt off her back. I mean, I very much so am my grandmother's child. And I think a lot of that bugs my mother in a way uh, that we are not as close as I was with, with my grandmother. But that was just because, you know, grandmother, what we call her mom, and I were just incredibly close. We went to Flyers games since I was a kid. We would talk sports. We often joked about the eulogies we would give at each other's funeral because that's how close we were. If whichever one of us passed away first, like we had a very, very strong dynamic. She would not date somebody without my approval. Like it was just, she was like, okay, like I, she's like, I need you to meet my grandson. And if he doesn't like you, then like, it's not going to work. Like we were just that close. It was that kind of a strong bond that some people just couldn't understand. And I truly believe that even though she's no longer here in in person she's always with me in spirit in fact i always like to tell the story that when she passed away everybody assumed i would be devastated i figured i'd be devastated but when i went to the hospital she just come out of surgery she was in a coma and I, I held her hand and i was like listen like you've been through a lot in your life girl like you know it's 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 okay like you don't got to keep fighting this if you don't want to like i will be okay you will you will be okay like i trust i trust that we're going to be fine but if you feel like it's your time to go then you know I'll be okay. And she squeezed my hand and I saw a tear come down her eye. And I was like, okay, I knew that that's what we were doing. And I looked at her and I said, just wait till I get back to your house before, before like anything happens, because I can't be in the hospital. If you pass away, I will, I will have a breakdown. And I drove back to her house. And then I got the call that as I walked in the door, she had passed away. And then that night I had a dream where I, where she was there and we spoke and we just spoke for hours and hours and hours and she explained like look i just want you to keep living your life i don't want you to derail everything like you know this is what i need from you is to not stop living because i'm never gonna not be there i'll always be watching you and then i was fine the next day and i went about my life yeah i was i was gonna ask you if you ever see her in your dreams because you know i see my grandmother in my dreams particularly in times of stress and trouble and I had that strong relationship with my grandmother too. She, when I was a little cross dresser running around at about four or five years old in my, in an oversized shirt, one of my mom's belt and my mom's little two inch pumps, you know, granny would let me do that. Hit, keep a lookout in case my parents came back and give the signals I can get back in my boy clothes. And so I'm here for the grannies who watch out for the little gay grandkids running around when the parents are too fucking stiff to get with the fucking program. So, yeah. <laughs> It's just the most mind-boggling thing. You know, grannies are born like the 20s and 30s, and you would think people born more recently would be the more open-minded ones, but they're just not. And so, so then your siblings don't necessarily have this strained relationship with your mom because she was more lenient on them. Yeah. So my siblings actually both live out in California with my mother currently. I do not. I live about as geographically far away as I can be. I'm on the East Coast. And, you know, I think that, yeah, there, there, there's some strain there, but not nearly as much as on that as we have. I actually don't have the world's greatest relationship with my brothers either. In a lot of ways, I explain that my brothers are very much like my mother. They're very type A. They're very materialistic, which is not, you know, you know a bad thing in itself. If that's what they are, that's what they are. Whereas I'm very much like my grandmother. 
which is very type C. There is more than one right way to do something. Like if there's a start line and a finish line, how you get there doesn't matter as long as you get there. My mother and my brother says a start line and the finish line is really only one correct way to get to the finish line is how I kind of like describe it. You know, to me, my life has been a, a struggling journey, right? Like it's been get knocked down, climb back up, get back down, climb back up. But the point is I always get back up and manage to get across the finish line. Whereas, you know, in I think my mother and my brother's eyes, it's get back, get knocked down, but then go this way. As opposed to, you know, I'm like, you know, do a bunch of circles, fall down a bunch of times, but I got there. But yeah, my brothers and I are starting to develop a better relationship now. It's not great. I'm One of them is better than the other. They're actually twins. So, you know, there was always that to contend with. But yeah, I, I really am actually not close with a lot of people in my biological family. I do have a very close chosen family, which, you know, we in this community very much so value. But as far as my biological family, I'm very close with my biological father, but like not anybody else. I am here for all of the chosen family. Fuck this blood relative trauma and fuck. <laughs> the blood relatives can be very, very bad for your health. Y'all pick you a better family. You do not have to contend with the, the blood relatives. Congratulations on the engagement. I heard you mention fiance. So actually, fun story about that. We actually had to do it twice. The first time I decided to do it at a pride party at Lobo, we were planning to do it the following month, but my mom actually got very upset that we didn't call and get her permission to get engaged and that she wasn't there. So she flew in the following month to Lobo and we did it all again so that she could be a part of it. <laughs> that is literally what we're dealing with which is not a bad thing in itself. I get that she wanted to feel like she was involved and I get that it was a big deal for her. Her oldest was getting engaged. She's very traditionalist in that way. I, you know, to me, I didn't really think it was a big deal in 2022 to have to call and be like, hey, I'm getting engaged, you know, but I guess she felt she should have been informed and that's fine, you know, and her, when she was my age, that was kind of the way it was, you know, talk to your mother, talk to your father, me, I'm like, screw it, I'm just going to do this. Like it was a, on a whim decision at four in the morning. So like, you know, yeah, but she did fly in the following month and we did it all again at Lobo in front of 400 people. Yeah, I mean, that's cute and all, but you lost me at permission. Yeah, yeah, it was, it was a choice. <laughs> it was a choice. No, we don't, we don't need nobody's permission to do the fucks we want to do. But see, that's why I'm always preaching for people to get over this addiction to family because inherent in blood family is a lot of control. Yeah. And a lot of assuming that this person in the family or that person in the family cannot do this unless we all agree it's good or somewhere, some kind of bullshit like that that <laughs> I tuned out years ago. I was like, oh, hell no. I observed my family. I'm like, you know what? All of y'all's fucked up. Each and every fucking last one of y'all don't really know how to live your damn life. So you're not about to try to tell me how to live mine, even though I am the youngest child. I got better sense than most people in my family, if not them all. <laughs> you know, so mm -mm. Mm -hmm. there will be no permission being granted <laughs> out of this. I never came out. I was like, if y'all can't figure it out, then shame on you. I'm doing my fucking life. Deal with it. <laughs> not about I mean, to that's it. Myself to you bitches. That that's it. Like that's that's a hundred percent it. There's a, there's a ton of control. That's why I've distanced myself from a lot of them. Yeah. So I just wanted to point out, we've been using the word chronic with this disease, y'all. And so what that means is that it's not like in the opposite of that is acute, meaning that it would go away over time or through treatment. Chronic means that in this particular case, that there's really no like set cure for the mitochondrial diseases. Well, so what they'll treat it with is like vitamins, physical therapy. I mean, any kind of therapy to help the patient feel better, to have a more comfortable life. They'll treat the symptom as they come up with various medications and stuff like that. But like with HIV, which is what, you know, I have a history of, there's no way to like, just say, get rid of it. You manage the symptoms and then you just promote an overall healthy life. So when we say chronic, that's what we mean. Exactly. And so... His website, y'all, is jakemaxwellproductions.com. Of course, that will go in the show notes. And then the, the social media and all of that will be there too. So I bring up the website because this, I want you to tell people about that website and about how it all got started. I read where when you were 24 that you decided that you were going to stop feeling sorry for yourself 
and stop letting your condition define you. So I want you to talk to me about this turning point that happened when you were 24. I want to hear about how your mind was before, because it sounds like you were in some sort of pity party or a state of low self-esteem or feeling sorry for yourself or something like that, which can happen to us when we get sick or, or you know, we, or when we're fighting these uphill battles. So talk to me your mindset before you had this revelation at 24 and then after. Yeah. So, you know, to understand that you kind of got to go back to like when I was 18, it's a little bit of a journey, right? So I had all these aspirations as a kid of all the things I would be doing with my life. And, you know, a lot of them I had achieved, like I worked, started working in politics when I was 16. I was on a presidential campaign. I was on a Senate campaign. I was on a congressional campaign. Like I had done all this stuff by the time I was 22. In fact, in 2016, I worked the presidential and was like the youngest one as a field director in Virginia. So without a college degree. So I had, I had like accomplished that. I did what I wanted to do on that front. And then, you know, 2016 happened and the whole world just kind of got flipped upside down. And I was not happy with the state of the world. And I was not happy with where I was at with my life. I was going through the situation where my grandmother had just passed away. And even though I was not really affected by it as much as I was, there there was some lingering effects, obviously, from losing that strong connection that I had. And I kind of, you know, was doing this DJ thing. I had, you know, actually, had, I've been in a kink relationship, not a not a dating one, but a kink one that had just ended and it ended very, very, very badly. And I was just like, you know, I'm unhappy. I have this condition that's going to kill me. Like I have, this is what was going through my mind, not currently, but at this time it was like, I have this condition that's going to kill me. I'm running into a wall. Like I'm, I don't know how to set path forward. I haven't gone to college. Like what, what am I doing? Like, what's the point? And Eventually, like literally, I was just lying in bed and one of my other friends called me and invited me out to a kink club, ironically, which is how this story starts. And I was like, I wasn't going to go, but he didn't really give me a choice. He said, you're coming or we're going to come pick you up and take you regardless. So it's like, all right, I'll go. You know, what have I got to lose? And I went. And at this party, I met someone named, named David Merrill. And this person was the catalyst for my DJ career. Over time, me and who would eventually become my chosen brother, best friend, and all around, like, biggest support for me in my life, Corey, a.k.a. Phoenix, he, we would do kink demos at David's party. Corey would, like, vlog me, right? And that's, that's how my career started. And then one day I went to David, I was like, David, can I, like, just DJ? I was like, the DJ is not here. Do you mind if I, like, just try? And he was like, yeah. I mean, you know, it can't be any worse than we've ever had, so go for it. And I went up there and I'm jamming and I'm having the time of my life. And I get done and I'm like, man, that was awesome. And he's like, no, no, it wasn't. But you have potential and I can see it in you and I can teach you because you have something I can't teach, which is drive. You have drive and determination. And I think you can get there if you get someone in your corner to give you the support and the skills that you need. And I'm going to do that for you. So sure enough, every day for like a year, I'd go over to David's house. And I'd work on DJing and he'd show me things. And then eventually he started booking me at his parties. And then the next thing you know, I'm doing more of his events, not just the one. We moved to another event and another event. And I'm starting to get a little bit of a following. And then we kind of hit the turning point moment for me, which is when I get reached out to by a bigger promoter. And they're like, we would really like to book you. We think you're great. We think you're talented. But we don't like that you're non-binary. And we don't like that you don't really look like what a traditional circuit party DJ should look like mm -hmm. uh, because I don't really have the abs and I'm not like ripped and I'm not all these other things that traditional circuit parties DJs at that time looked like. And I'm like, excuse the fuck out of me. The hell does that mean? And they were just like, well, you know, we just don't think you'll like react well or the crowd will connect with you like some of our other DJs. I'm like, oh, okay, cool. Hold my beer. So I, I looked to Corey and, and my friend Pilot at the time, and we start we started Lobo, and that that's what it was. We we basically started it because we wanted a safe space for everybody else who wasn't welcome at these these circuit parties. So we describe Lobo really as like a diverse circuit party. You're you're not gonna walk in the Lobo and see a bunch of cookie cutter gays. You're gonna see the everybody else, um, and that's what we describe it as. You're gonna see the bears, the kinksters, the pups, the furries. You know your big guys, your little guys, everything in between, except for that traditional 
you know, Abercrombie and Fitch gay, so to speak. That's how I describe it. And they come too, but in this case, they're not the majority, they're in the minority. And the looks on their faces when they walk in is what makes it like <laughs> just that much spe- more special because they it, it dawns that this is a party for everyone and always will be. But that turning point really for me, essentially be, it happened on a whim because I was just like, you know, I need to stop trying to be what my mother wants. I have to stop trying to be what everybody else wants me to be. And if I really want to be happy and DJing makes me happy, why not? Like, I am not beholden to anybody else's expectations of me. I am not beholden to anybody else's what they want me to be. I basically was like, this is my life. And yeah, I may have all these conditions and whatever and this, that, and the other. But you know what? There are people far worse off in the world than me who are doing far greater things. And sure, I could sit around and be sorry for myself and sit in my room and just cry and do all these things, or I can go out and do something about it. And by doing something about it, it has now gotten to the point where we could start the nonprofit, where we can give back to others who may need that quote unquote kick in the butt supporting shoulder to get them going. Talk to me. I commend your ambition here for me fighting to maintain a positive attitude, making decisions. I appreciate the mentor who have to mentor you and groom you into DJing. So t- talk to me about how you give back. You mentioned like you go back to your high school from time to time to give out. I know Lobo has some sort of youth initiative. So tell me about all the ways that you give back. Yeah. So the first and easiest way to say how Lobo gives back is Lobo has a policy that we will never price anybody out of a party. If you can't afford to come to our party, you just shoot us a message saying, hey, I need a ticket and we give you a ticket. It's a no questions asked policy. Like we will never tell somebody that you cannot come to a community event. And the reason for that is no one should be told, oh, well, we know how much this means to you. And we know that you have friends in your community here. But sorry, if you can't afford the $15, you just can't come. It is a literally no questions asked policy. We will give you a ticket. Now, if that starts happening every single month, we may have a talk, but essentially the way it is, is we buy a block of tickets every month as Lobo to just give out the people. We don't ask why, we don't ask the policy, it's literally, I need a ticket, done, here you go. Like, that's it. And again, the main reason for that is because we know the impact this has on people. We made that decision at day one, that we were never going to be the party that was so full of itself that we were going to tell people, if you can't afford to go, too, too bad. So that's, that's the first thing. And that happens in every city we go to, all across the country. At every party we do, that is like a non-negotiable. So do we lose money on it? Sometimes, but it's worth it for us because community first. That's what our event's always been about. Recently, we also launched the nonprofit, which is the Lobo Initiative. I believe we officially now have finally, finally gotten our letter from the IRS. I have to check. It's supposedly in the mail, but it's taken them like eight months to officially get back to us because they were so backlogged. But that's why we've been like more quiet about it saying that it's been approved and so we're starting to roll it out and the main the main focus of the nonprofit essentially is like to focus on lgbtq specifically youth adults and adolescents and with a key focus on those with disabilities who want to chase their dreams but just don't have the financial support or the emotional support to get there the easiest way i describe it is you know one of our programs is the mentorship scholarship program You tell us, I want to be a DJ. We buy you equipment and give you a mentor in that field who will help you. And it's two pronged for this reason. One, getting the equipment is great, but you also need someone to help open doors for you, right? Because that's how all fields work. It's all about communication and networking. And you can be really, really talented, but if you don't have somebody to sometimes help get you in, that can be half the battle. If you don't have someone you can call like, hey, I just got offered this opportunity. Do you think it's legitimate? That can be a huge thing. So we pair you with a mentor to help teach you your craft, but then also continually be there to help you along your journey. And that's one when we explain it. What we don't do is give out cash value. We give out equipment. We give out classes. We give out basic things that can help people go after their dreams because that was the big thing for me. Had I had that support earlier, who knows where I would be now? Wow. There was a time that I wanted to become a DJ and I did it go and research it. I would go to like the guitar center and just different places and try to Google it and find it out. But it is so you it is not as simple as, you know, getting turntables or now, you know, like a MacBook, you know, putting an app on it and then just going, hey, I'm going to throw a party. (laughs) So, you know, it was so it was so such a struggle to figure out where the fuck do I get started? Okay, so I get the equipment. I start practicing at home. 
then where do I go? Do I go knock on doors? You know, you know, so the fact that you streamline this process and, 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 and to at least give people a chance, and they're going to be those who start, who won't keep down the path, but at least they could say that, you know, they were given an opportunity. Right. And being willing to open doors or people in the industry, you're trying to give them what you got. or was just somebody to help to vouch for you. You know, I, you know, when you started DJing, I wished to the heavens, you know, to God that we had that in every industry, you know, because there is so much good talent out there, but it's, it's, it's so much of it to this day. It's about who, you know, is like that in the author industry, you know, I'm a good writer, you know, but you know, and I have a lot of good stories to tell, but trying to get it out there is difficult because there's no like, you know, mentor for, you know, for me to do that. So I appreciate the fuck out of that. Um, oh my God, like who knows? Maybe I'll, I'll go to DC or something and join your initiative and become a DJ at last. <laughs> so, so one of the cool things about it is we actually have mentors in all fields. We have people who work in the author industry. We have people who are writers, artists, DJs. Like I use DJ as the example because that's the easiest way to say. But we have someone reaches out to us like, hey, I want to be a film, film a, a director. We have film editors who do YouTube, who are big YouTube stars and all these other things who will help, you know, teach them. And we'll send them a camera and we'll be like, hey, you know, here you go. Here's who you reach out to, you know, talk to them. Our whole thing is basically if you tell us what you want to do, we will find somebody who can help you and get you what you need. It's it's really that simple. And that is why, you know, we believe that it's so important to have this because it's one of those things where, you know, there are so many people, like you said, in so many fields who are ridiculously freaking talented at what they do, but they just don't have the monetary support. They don't have the equipment support. They don't have the mentor to open doors. And so because of that, they fall through the cracks. And that is what we want to pick up the pieces in because especially in the disability community, but across the LGBTQ and really all communities in general, you know, people slip through the cracks and that's when we have this opportunity where we miss so many great talented people. Hallelujah, Jesus. It does. Well, then we'll talk after the show about what you might or might not <laughs> do for me. You know, I can't lose anything by asking, you know, so, I don't like how they were trying to change you, you know, that opposition you met for being who you are, you know, because the only reason that, that, that production company would have reached out to you and told you all of this would have been because they had in mind a way that they could change you and make you into a different person. You know, other than that, there's no reason to reach out and be like, we love everything about you except for who you actually are. So change that. And then, you know, we can make this work. I come up against that in the writing industry because I write very like real, you know, if we're talking about getting fucked in the ass and come spraying <laughs> on the place and shooting up meth and blood on the ceiling, then that's what the fuck we're going to say. We're not, there's no other way to say it because of what happened, happened. But a lot of people are very conservative who hold a lot of power in a lot of different industries, especially in the music industry. And it, people who, who create very polarizing art, you know, you know, it sucks when your work lands on the desk of that conservative bitch, you know, you know, in the publishing house or in the, you know, be it music or, you know, literary or whatever, because that person, I've seen them take like an adverse reaction to work, whereas had a more liberal person gotten a hold of it, they would have gotten the point as opposed to clutching their pearls and shit and cutting off their circulation. Now they can't fucking think straight. You know, both what's in front of them. So... What cities is Lobo in? Because when I looked it up, one thing, you know, like just what cities? I know you're at least in D.C., Columbus, Ohio, Virginia Beach, Norfolk area. Where else? Yeah. So our website is a little bit behind because we're growing much quicker than one person can keep up with it. But currently we are in Norfolk, Virginia Beach. That's one Columbus, D.C., Pittsburgh, New York, with a couple other cities on the, on the way in addition to some other ones that we'll be returning to. But those are the big ones that we're at regularly. We also have Richmond coming soon. In addition to Lobo the Party, we also have Lobo the Drag Show slash Drag Brunch, which is in New York, Norfolk, and D.C. as well, which we do to elevate queens who just want to get experience and also those who are incredibly talented. So we do that. And those that's where we are currently. 
I can't say some of the other cities we haven't announced officially yet, but we do have some more in the wings coming soon. Okay, I'm taking a note on that Lobo Drag Show. I'll be in New York in November. Well, we should we should talk. We should talk. <laughs> <laughs> just the first weekend in November. So we'll see uh, what's going on. For sure. So, so the circuit parties, you know, they're only like, the, the prices also are like $10, $15. It's not super expensive to begin with for what a circuit party could cost. Yeah. <laughs> so I thought the pricing was very, very humble. And I'm so pleased to hear that you're really going out of your way to reach for pe people. Do you have like, a story of someone who came, came to one of your events or one of your locations, like a before, a good before and after story. Oh yeah, I got plenty. We get, we get messages from people all the time who have literally said that our event has changed their life. And that's one of the things that, uh, actually I'm going to pull one up right now. Sorry, I got to find it because there's one I do like to tell like at the very onset because it was so meaningful. That's fine. While you're so, looking at that, I have another question. So, so in all of these cities, do you have like an office? Or do you have people who work for your organization? And then congratulations on officially becoming a nonprofit. Yes. So, so do you have a physical location? Because these parties don't happen like, say, every weekend. So do the easiest way to explain it is Lobo the party is for profit and the Lobo initiative is nonprofit. Okay. So Lobo... The party, which is where we are in multiple cities officially, we don't have offices, but we do have people on the ground in all of those cities who, and we have telegram chats for every city we're in. So people can come and join and find that sense of community for the city that they're, they're going to. So there's a Lobo Columbus chat, a Lobo DC chat, a Lobo Norfolk chat. And these are like just the telegram is a message that a lot of furries and pups use. And what it is, is it's just another way to create this sense of community where people can just kind of come and express themselves. We also have the one community shared for Lobo as all cities share it. It is the Lobo horny jail chat. You can probably figure out what happened in that chat, but that is because we don't believe in people being restricted and expressing themselves. We've never been about that. Like, go on, express yourself, like, you know, do your thing. So that is the chat for all the cities to come and do their extracurricular horny stuff with. But that one's always fun to just kind of pop in and see what's going on. But yes, we do have people and admins in all those chats. We also have a community Discord where people can go. So that is how we connect with everybody. I'm always reachable. That's partly why I'm so tired is because I respond to messages like 24-7. But yeah, one of the things we tell people is when we go to a city, we don't just want to be the party that comes in, takes your money, and leaves until we come back. We are all about celebrating and laying down community roots. And a lot of these cities already have community organizations outside of us. So we work with them, with those local organizations to help them get funding or whatever we can do to help elevate their events because we don't need to have a monopoly on this type of an event that doesn't help anybody if they're succeeding we're succeeding and that's what we're all about okay that's pretty kick-ass so basically since you have a network people can just they do like meetups and stuff like that they can still physically reach out and touch somebody in these various cities if need be so we yeah. find all of this at the website? All the Telegram chats are on the website. We also have a general announcement channel on Telegram, which has all this info. We put it out on Twitter regularly in rotation, how to join the chats. But basically, on all of our socials, you can usually find your way to whatever chat you're looking for. Or if you happen to end up in the wrong chat, someone will immediately get you to the right one. <laughs> but oftentimes, what we see is that people join all the Lobo chats because they just want to, even if they're not anywhere near that city. Oh, how fun. Okay. Do you have that before? I do. So one of the messages we got a couple, actually at the January of this year, was from a friend of mine who has become very close to me. And the message kind of went something like this. Um, it says, real talk. I have to say straight to you. I can't tell you how grateful I am for Lobo. I only found out about it around a month ago, and it became genuinely one of the best months of my life arguably the best. I've had a very long history of depression and loneliness. I wasn't exactly popular in school growing up, being an already painfully shy, weird kid. And I was really nose diving this year. Then I ended up being introduced to this community and have done a total 180. As far as my mental health goes, for the first time in my life, I felt like I've had a true friend group and I can't describe how amazing that felt. Put it this way, the day after the December Lobo, I felt really strange and it took a few hours into that day to realize that that strange feeling was because it was the first time 
and I couldn't begin to guess how long that I woke up without a black cloud on my mind. The sun seemed brighter, my vision was sharper, the world just felt so much more alive to me. As I've reflected on my past, what's happened for me this past month, I realized how much I was doing mentally in 2021, and the contrast of how amazing this December has been like for me. I've come to swear Lobo has pretty much saved my life. It was getting that bad for me. I really don't think I could thank you enough for making Lobo a thing. Well, I'm here for all of that. Let me go on ahead and give you a clap and a clap. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and you get messages like that and just like it hits you so deep. Like, I mean, I cry sometimes when I get messages like this because one of the things that is sometimes hard for me to realize is that we've created something. And I, I, I often get credited for it, but it's me and my entire team and my co-owner and best friend and brother by choice, Phoenix. Like we have built this thing from the DC Eagle, the stinky little party in DC into something so much bigger than we could have ever imagined. And sometimes I especially kind of live in this bubble where I'm not aware how many people it's impacting or the impact it's having. And so when we get that me messages like that, it's like, oh my goodness. And at the end of the day, you know, people are always like, well, why, like, why even bother keep doing it? And I always tell them the following, which is that, yes, doing Lobo and being on the road every weekend and traveling is terrible for me medically. And will probably take a couple of years off my, off my life. And I'm okay with that. I'm okay with that trade-off. And the reason for that is very simple. I am making people's lives better. My team is making people's lives better. We are creating a community event that is impacting the world. And that's all I've ever wanted. If I was to die tomorrow, I, I could leave a legacy that we've changed some people's lives. And that's all I've ever wanted to do. And so for me, if you're telling me that I would lose a couple of years in exchange for saving a couple of people, then that's fine. If you're telling me that I can leave the world in this a legacy in this event that basically will help to create to find people their chosen family, I'm okay with that at the end of the day. Because that is what I've always wanted to do is basically live life like my grandmother and leave the world in a better place than I found it. And right now there's a lot of people leaving the world in a much shittier place than they found it. But if I can just impact one person, then it was worth it for me. Amen to everything you just said. Um, I mean, you mentioned having, you know, fighting the disease and traveling and, you know, and I know DJs don't exactly get off work at 5 p.m. So I know, I know you're working <laughs> a wee hour. So is there any sort of special thing that you do to keep you going? Because I know you mentioned fatigue can be one of the symptoms. So how are, how do you manage the disease and do all that you do? Red Bull. <laughs> lots and lots of Red Bull. Now, so the DJ answer is Red Bull and caffeine pills, but the actual answer is basically from Monday to really like Thursday, it's sleep and recovery. And then starting on Thursday night, it's travel and Friday and Saturday, it's go. And then we start the process over again. That's really what it is. It is draining. It is hard. It is rough. It is not easy with the Mito. But at the end of the day, like I always say, it's, you know, the look on people's faces at Lobo and the messages that keep me going. It's it's knowing that we're doing something and that ultimately I get to live a life that many people wish they could. And I'm very appreciative for that, but I'm also not mistaken on how many people sacrificed for me along the way to get me here. You are a grateful motherfucker. I'm, I'm, <laughs> oh, I love it. So to explain, Jake, I read where you do like, you create events for people with sensory issues. I want to know what sort of sensory issues you speak of and how you tailor it. Yeah, so that's something new we are still laying the groundwork for, but that we have done. And what we are trying to do is basically create nightclub events for people who, who have sensory issues, sensory overload, loud noises, lights. Like, you know, we can do one of the things that people often say is, and this is especially true in kink and nightlife, just for the record, is I can't make this accessible well sure you can you just don't want to you don't want to put any extra legwork to get it there there are times when you can't make something accessible like if there's only a stairway up i get that but you know don't tell me you can't play the music at a lower level on a, on a certain night and not do a bunch of flashing lights like that's that's an easy fix that's an incredibly easy fix it's just the fear of alienating your ongoing base is what is preventing people in a lot of ways with a lot of disability accessibility, it's fear of alienating those who might not want that. And you can hear, I think, some of the passion in my voice when we talk about this, because as someone with a disability, I never want someone to feel like they can't go somewhere because of something that may trigger something for them. 
So one of the things we're trying to do is create basically nightlife events that would be welcoming to people who can't be around loud music all the time. Or if something for like people who can't be around flashing lights, one of the things we try to eliminate is any loud sudden bangs or noises at Lobo. Um, we try to go out of our way to find venues that are accessible. We can't always do it because one of the things you're working at with nightlife venues, a lot of them are older. So we can't always find places that have elevators, but a lot of our venues do. And that is one of the things that I think we can do a better job of because I acknowledge that. Like, even though we do a lot, there's always more we can be doing. And so I think that, yes, we're aiming to do more sensory overload, welcoming, friendly events. But that just comes from me being on the spectrum. Like one of my best friends, Jay, is heavily, heavily, heavily on the spectrum. And I know that if there's any incredibly loud noises around them, they could they could have a panic attack. And so we go out of our way to try to make everything as accessible and welcoming as possible. It's very rare I meet somebody who I would say seems to be about as thorough as I am. But you, because I, I keep my, my bases and my grounds fucking covered. I don't miss very much. But I take my hat off to you, motherfucker. <laughs> my back. You know, you have so much love and heart at the center of what you're doing and you're not money motivated. And that's something that I find to be highly attractive. You know, when you, you know, I tend to run from people who are like money first, you know, the money clearly has to be made, but you know, it doesn't, I don't really feel like that should be like the central focus. And I really feel like you have your priorities in order. Yeah. One of the biggest things that we decided when we started Lobo, it was a very, we had a very like the discussion about it was, are we going to be a a business business first like you know it's money 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 like that's the focus and we'll raise prices and as we go and as we go and we'll continue to raise prices and we'll become a circuit party or are we a community event that's also making money and we decided that we were going to put community first and while yes money has to be made to sustain the business that's just a fact of life and because this is what i do for a living i think everybody gets that we will not price anybody out and that's just a policy that even we've had other promoters say, well, you can't continue to do that. Why not? Why, why the fuck not? Like, what, what, like, yes, you can have your circuit party for $45 and you can, can kick people out who can't afford that. We're not going to do that. That's never been what we're about. And I, you know, it's to me, it's mind boggling that someone could look at an event they're putting on and being like, yeah, I only want people who can afford to be here. Well, then what's the like, what are you serving? Like, right. Like, then you're just. You know, you know better than some of the big corporations like Amazon and other, these other places. So we decided from the onset that we were going to put our community first, and that meant that all of our events are gender inclusive. If there's a bar that's like men only, we're like thanks, but no thanks. That meant that all of our events were kink inclusive. But there's a bar like, well, we don't want X Y Z kink, thanks, but no thanks. We've turned down bars because they've said we only want blah blah blah, and we've said that's not going to work for us. It's everybody or nobody. We've had bars said we only want. You know, men, no, thank you. Like, no straight women, no, thank you. It's everybody or nobody. And that's just how it's going to be. Oh, you got to preach. You sound better than than any church I've ever been in. <laughs> <laughs> so t- tell us, so you mentioned kink and pup play. Tell us what is kink and what is pup play. And there's all kinds of things in the kink world where for some reason this pup play seems to stand out with you. Yeah. So first off, kink is very important to me. It is an, It is a form of self-expression that I think most people have a misunderstood idea about. But once they learn about it, our, their world changes forever, right? It is one of the most welcoming communities, for the most part, asterisk, for the most part, in general, when we talk about kink, right? It encompasses so many things, but pup play especially is important to me because it's one of the reasons and the, it is the community that helped build me up, right? When we talk about people who have sacrificed to get me to where I am, there were about six or seven pups in D.C. who, when I pitched them the idea of Lobo, worked the first year and a half, two years for free, like did not want to get paid because the event wasn't making money. But I asked them to trust in my vision and they did. And they followed me through hell and back. And now they are all still here as we are climbing the mountain and finally everybody's getting paid. But they took that leap of faith, right? And that was a big deal for me. And I will never, ever forget that. But the pup community are the people who came out to my shows. They're the people that welcomed me in. And I am a pup myself. And when we talk about pup play, like people are often like, oh, you have to have gear 
you have to do this, you have to do that. Like with all kinks, it's whatever you want to do with it, right? There is no right or wrong way to do it as long as you're respecting everybody's consent and everybody's legal rights and all that, then do what you want and fuck anybody who tells you you have to do it a certain way. And that's partly why I feel as connected to it. When I came back to D.C., originally coming back from Florida, pup play is where I found myself and partly why I picked myself back up. I found that family in the pup community. And while there's a lot of drama in the pup and furry community in general, I wouldn't trade any of them or any of it because really it's a it's a family, right? And we fight like a family. And I guess, guess for me, it's just something that has been become such a part of my life that it's 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 just ingrained. Like everybody calls me Ultra, right? Because that's my pup name. I started as DJ Ultra Pup, even though I go by Jake Maxwell now. And even my family calls me Ultra now. Like it's just become ingrained in my personality. The other day when I was in the ER, they the the nurse stuck me with an IV and I accidentally barked. And the nurses there know me so well that they're used to that now. That's like how ingrained it is in my in my in my personality. So that's not to say that I think I'm a dog, but like, you know, it is to say that pup play is part of my life and it's part that I wouldn't trade away. Then I hear a bark. Oh goodness. Oh man. See, the problem is I can't do it like on command because like, I'm really bad at it. It's one of those things where like, it just comes out like, you know, I'll a woo or I'll just go rah, 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 rah. Like, uh, you'll see me like, rah, 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 rah. like, you know, like, like waving like the paw, but like, yeah, it's, it's, it's one of those things where it's like, I can never do it on command. You have to be, it's like a moment of inspiration. Yeah. You have to be in pup space okay. or head space. Okay. Okay. I feel you. Okay, so then the last thing we want to talk about is drugs, man. Drugs. Yeah. Uh, before we got on the broadcast, you were telling me about how you have been using ketamine therapy, which is now legal, I think, in all 50 states. Yes. To combat depression, I just got back from Oregon doing a solo. I went and did a, an eight-hour solo <laughs> session with a social worker and an eight-hour MDMA session with a social worker. It took seven grams of shrooms before I felt anything and I'm being told that that's a lot so there's <laughs> more to come on that later on when I do my show to kind of break down what happened so talk to us about your ketamine therapy journey what it's done for you yeah so being in nightlife I am surrounded by people consistently who are doing extracurricular drugs and all these fun things right drinking and all this stuff a lot of my staff like genuinely does it my brother and best friend Corey does it like so I, however, have always been straight edge, partly because I have the depression and partly because I have severe anxiety. Corey, again, chosen brother by Corey Phoenix, has gone out of his way to make sure nobody in D.C. will give me anything, even if I ask, because he wasn't because the one time I got accidentally dosed with GHB at the nightclub, I was depressed for three weeks and would not go to the bed. I had a really, really, really bad reaction, and that was from just a sip of GHB. So. When the doctor suggested doing ketamine as a treatment, I was like, okay, that is a choice. But yeah, why not? Why not? And I spoke to Corey about it. And Corey's like, yeah, let's, let, you know, it can't be any worse than where you're at, right? Like, so we did it and it's been transformative. I mean, so the about four weeks ago, I did my first treatment and I was going through a lot that week. You know, Lobo had just had its first event in D.C. without me there, like DJing or being a part of it. I took my hands off the wheel, which is something I'm trying to do more and trust my staff more. And I took my hands off the wheel and it became one of our most successful events, which is good. Any sane person would be overjoyed that their company is having a successful event without them there. For whatever reason, the screwed up autism brain, like depression brain, anxiety brain that I was dealing with at that time was like, Oh, they don't need me anymore. Like the, the, we went right down that rabbit hole, right? Which is not what should have happened. And I just, just already depressed and I was going through a lot. And that is what made me kind of snap. And so I drove back that night and I was, should not have driven back from Virginia beach that night, but I did up to DC just because I wanted to be back in my own bed. And I had a really bad drive and a really bad night. And I was really depressed and I almost drove my car off a bridge. And then two days later, we did a ketamine treatment. And I was like, all right, well, this is going to be fun. And in that ketamine treatment, I talked with my almost, I guess, myself or something. And myself was like, dude, you're an idiot. Like, why on earth are you upset about this? 
Like what kind of monster would be angry that something you helped build is successful without you? This is what we want. It means you don't have to be there every month. You can focus on other cities. This is a good thing. And you and, there were, and then this voice in my head, which I assume was awesome, it was like, you need to call Corey and be like, hey, I'm sorry. I shouldn't have reacted this way. I made a mistake. I'm really happy the event was successful. I was going through a lot. I will be better in the future. And then as soon as I came out of my trip, I immediately called Corey and said all that. And Corey was like, I didn't expect that. I was like, I didn't expect that either. But that is what happened on the first trip. And I dealt with a lot of that like head on, like right out the gate. And ever since then, we've been dealing with things, kind of past traumas as I'm doing the ketamine treatment. And that is kind of been mind boggling to me that this, this, this ketamine, so to speak, has been able to help me overcome all these things. Well, I'm so thankful for all of these new treatments, the MDMA, the psilocybin, the, you know, the LSD that's coming back around from where the nasty government, our government, you know, shut them down years ago when they were just really starting to get their root, you know, and get their legs underneath them. But, you know, delay is not denial. And so we have our drugs being legalized, <laughs> criminalized so that we can use them to heal ourselves. And so I appreciate your candidness. And your openness and your honesty on the show today, Jake. The website, y'all, is jakemaxwellproductions.com that will go in the showy notes. They are on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Jake, go ahead. You take the last word. Say anything you want to say. Give out any wisdom you want to give out. Throw any shade that needs to be done. Whatever the fuck you want to do, just do it. Yeah. I just want to take a moment and acknowledge as we're coming up on Indigenous Peoples Day that. While this country continues to make strides on racial progress and on progress in general, we have a long way to go. And I've been noticing a lot on social media where people seem to be wanting to take victory laps on how far we've come. But the reality is we have got so much further to go. So if you are a cisgender white male, especially, and you have the ability to help allies and be an ally for those who need you, those communities that need you right now, please reach out and help where you can. Because the fact of the matter is, is that we have lived in a lot of us have lived in this bubble more or less where we have grown up thinking that you know the world is this perfect wonderful place and the reality is that it is not but we can make it that but it starts with all of us we all have a part to play whether that's as an ally or in the streets and so if you are out there and you are hearing this just know that you can do more even when you think you've done enough you haven't so that's just what i've done amen <laughs> amen <laughs> Thank you all so much for taking time to listen to the Sex, Drugs, and Jesus podcast. It really means everything to me. Look, if you love the show, you can find more information and resources at sexdrugsandjesus.com or wherever you listen to your podcast. Feel free to reach out to me directly at thebannon at sexdrugsandjesus.com and on Twitter and Facebook as well. My name is The Bannon. It's been wonderful being your host today. And just remember that everything is going to be all right.